<clears throat> without kind of without really going too far into the actual, you know, I didn't want anybody to feel like they had to be a, a physiologist or um, a biochemist in order to follow what was going on. And, and I hope everybody was able to follow. We had a good, some great questions at the end uh, last time. I think this is going to go relatively quickly. So I hope there's a fair bit of time at the end of this also, also for questions. But <clears throat> By now, I hope that you are beginning to understand that you know, what I've try, tried to do is not necessarily, I didn't create this intellectual framework about which, upon which training rests or within which training rests um, or the science of training. I just tried to make it more accessible to people and was really trying to make it so that um, folks could could see how it uh, all fit together. And that, so we started with physiology now we're kind of talking about um, about the uh, models, and we want to talk about how models work in terms of trying to understand the training, how we apply the tr training. And <clears throat> it's really kind of a trial and error sort of thing that's happened over the decades. And so there's a heuristic for training, and that basically is that we come up with ideas that we you know we think are going to work, and we try them, and then you know the the good ideas are um, kept around and refined, and and the bad ideas tend to get rejected. But often, you know, it's kind of seat of the pants, like a lot of heuristics in life. You know, when you you learn to like, don't touch that hot stove. Well, that's a heuristic. Well, you also understand certain things about training in the same way. It's like, oh, I tried that once and didn't work very well. And as a consequence of after, you know, a century or so of this kind of development, a pretty darn good model has um has floated to the top. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And it's going to, going to contain some of the physiology that we spoke about the last two times, but it's also going to be, you know, really more nuts and bolts. And, and um, so I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do though, is I am going to share with you, this is top secret. How come it's not, there we go. Um, I haven't ever told anybody this, so you guys are privy to this for the first time ever. I would share my training philosophy. Um, it's really not that secret, um, but I haven't really ever sat down and laid this out um, for other people. I've been using this for you know several decades, but uh, and again, like most of the things I talk about here, I did not invent this, but I learned it from other better coaches. But so the, the first thing we need to do when we're thinking about setting up training is what are the demands of the sport or the event that you're training for? That's the most important thing. And um, so once you understand those demands, then you can then you start thinking about what are the qualities that are needed in order to meet the demands of the event. And that's where we go back to the physiology, you know, how, what, what kind of speed, what kind of strength, uh, what sort of endurance is needed. Um, you know, is there a lot of, you know, is it some heavy lifting? You can be carrying a heavy pack steeply uphill, like in mountaineering. So strength plays a bigger role perhaps than let's say, you know, running on trails does. So all of those things um, are needed to, needed to be understood. And the way I like to understand them is to break them down into what I call these fundamental qualities, you know, basically speed, strength, um, endurance. And, but then there's also technical skills. Those are um, very important. And then once you've uh, defined these, then you need to figure out which one is holding you back, which one is keeping you from performing better than you uh, currently are. And then you start designing the training that would improve your capacity at whatever that weakest thing is, or several weakest things, perhaps. And then you want to increase your capacity. Uh, we'll leave aside skills and technique for the moment, because I want to talk about work capacity mostly tonight. And so we want to increase your work capacity in these weak, whatever these weak qualities are. And we do that in a base period. And that's really the purpose of the base period is to elevate those qualities. And we do that by training them independently of one another. And, and I'll give you kind of an, an example of this. Perhaps it would, per, I think a lot of people make this mistake. 
So what's when they introduce, let's say, high intensity training into their program, um, maybe they're going to be doing intervals or something like that. And so they plan to go run, I will make up some hard interval workout that, you know, pretty typical for a lot of mountain athletes at some point will in their training will be, okay, I'm going to do five times five minutes up this steep hill. And they, they, when they do that, they're bringing together several qualities. They're bringing to be, together aerobic capacity. They're bringing to be, together muscular endurance. They're bringing anaerobic capacity into this, um, and so they're and they're bringing them all into this one workout. And that's not a bad thing, except if one of those qualities is really poor. And the quality that I see most frequently as a problem is muscular endurance. And so the person will start with these five by five minutes and up this hill and the first two or maybe even three are going to go pretty well. And then they're going to notice that they start getting a lot slower. They can't reach the same high spot, high point that they reached before. And they probably notice that they can't get their heart rate up to the same um, level that they were getting it before. That's because local muscular fatigue is what's slowing them down. It's not their aerobic capacity, probably not even anaerobic capacity, but local muscular fatigue. And so what I normally do with something like that, if I identify that as a problem, and I would say this is a problem for 90% of the people I've ever coached, is we go and tackle local, that local muscular fatigue with muscular endurance training so that when later in the training we come around to combining these qualities into one workout, we now have elevated the weakest link in that particular type of workout so that it's no longer the weakest link. And then the workout provides the kind of benefits and gains that, you know, the athlete was really hoping to get, or the coach was hoping to get when they designed it. So this is what's in, um, that part uh, number six there, basically, I've just talked about that. We bring these qualities together and um, th we're going to talk a little bit more about capacity and utilization, but when you bring them together, these qualities together in a workout or a race, you're utilizing whatever the capacity that you happen to have in that fundamental quality on that given day. And again, if one of them is weak, for instance, if you're, if you are, um, let's use a rock climbing analogy. So you might be able to do, you know, 50 pull-ups and you might, you might be able to do 50 pull-ups off of a 20 millimeter edge. You might be incredibly strong, have very strong hands, but your, your, the rest of your climbing technique kind of sucks. So you've been training this one particular quality to improve your hand strength, but you haven't been training well, well enough on the technique that's required to climb at the level that you should be able to climb if you have that strong of a hands. And so when you go outdoors to climb, if you haven't been working on this technique quality, that's going to be what holds you back because you're going to be utilizing whatever the, the level of technique that you happen to bring. So if you've got, you know, 514 hand strength, but you've got 511 technique, you're only going to climb 511. So I hope that makes some sense about how we want to, you know, take the, take the demands, and then figure out what the fundamental qualities are that are needed, find your weakest one, and start elevating the capacity of the weak. You, you can train all of them together, but you want to really focus on the one that's the weakest um, because it's easier, first of all, it's easier to improve the thing that you're worst at than the something that you're already very good at. So anyway, that's uh, my secret training philosophy, if anybody ever wanted to know. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about some concepts and ideas that, you know, kind of theoretical stuff. So we, the first one is training effect. Um, I think people maybe even intuitively understand these. You probably have seen it in the book that, you know, you, you do a workout, it, that baseline, that, that horizontal line of fitness level is, you know, representing your, your, your fitness at the moment when you do this, whatever this training session was. And it drives you into a state of fatigue represented by those, those three lines, the, the green, the blue, and the red line that dip below the horizontal line. And then at a, some later time, and we'll talk about how long this takes later, at some later time, it could be from a matter of a few hours to a few days, you you recover, you, that your body adapts to whatever that training stress was that you applied. And you, if things are done perfectly, you are, whatever that quality is or group of qualities that you were training in that workout, they will 
um, be better at some time in the future, they will have, um, undergo what's called a super compensation. And so you'll be a little fitter uh, again. And if you do this, you know, over and over and over again, that black horizontal fitness line rises um, as you go through, you know, a long, a long period of this. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what happens when you apply some, we're going to talk mostly about endurance training tonight. Um, we will get into strength and speed and power later. That's another chapter, but this is more conceptual stuff we're talking about tonight. So this endurance training cascade, the way I've presented it is, it took me a while to kind of figure this out, but basically you do some, you apply some kind of training stress to your body. That's the training stimuli. You know, that could be, again, doing 20 millimeter pull-ups. It could be doing that interval workout. It could be going for a long run or a ski in the mountains. You know, it'll be some kind of a, a stress to your body. It needs to be a stress because your body is going to react to that stress. And it's and in this case, because we're training endurance and endurance, as you might remember from our previous two discussions on physiology, endurance is a metabolic quality. And so you're taxing the metabolism of the muscle cells that are being that are used in whatever this training session was. They don't like that. They don't want to be embarrassed that they're not that they don't have the capacity for that kind of work. So it actually sets up a signaling pathway. Um, and there's a whole bunch of these signaling pathways. The most common one, the most potent one that that I know of and that that I think is well understood, that relates to improving endurance is called the AMPK. That's the adenosine monophosphate um, kinase. So it starts, it, it, the kinase being a, an enzyme. So um, the, when you, when the, the ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is broken down to the point to where it becomes adenosine monophosphate, in other words, only one phosphate group that's attached, that um, creates this. Uh, this enzyme is produced and that enzyme then signals the protein synthesis, which in this case, the AMPK signaling pathway creates more mitochondria. So if you stimulate this pathway by, and there's a lot of different ways you can train it, but endurance basically means you run until you, you go out and run around until you get tired, essentially. Um, although one of the biggest uh, I think we talked about this last time. Um, one of the biggest signaling um, effects for to start that AMPK um, pathway is um, glycogen depletion in the muscle cells. So again, you go out for a two hour run. At the end of that run, most of those muscles are going to be somewhat glycogen depleted. So that signaling pathway, AMPK sat pathway gets started, signals a whole bunch of pro, um, protein synthesis, which causes the, an increase in the mitochondrial mass in the muscle cell, which is this, mito, this metabolic adaptation that's down there near the bottom, which in the end will result in improved performance. So that's the theory behind how, how training for endurance actually works. There would be a similar cascade like this for strength, but we're again, not talking about strength tonight. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, I don't, won't, might not be able to see everyone while I'm presenting, but if anybody does, um, speak up so I can hear you and address these as we go along. But like I said, I think we'll get through this and there'll be plenty of time at the end. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is the concept of capacity and utilization training that I alluded to a couple slides ago. So when we're building the capacity, and this could be thought of as work capacity, your ability to do work in some realm. So again, that could be pull-ups, that could be you know running fast uphill, it could be running a long time in the mountains. It could be there's a whole bunch of type of different types of work capacity that we can improve. But when we're doing an, um, capacity training, the idea is that we're we're seeking to improve the long-term performance potential of the athlete sometime out in the future. And it's probably going to happen at the expense of near-term performance. And you, you can think of this actually makes, I think, intuitive sense to people if we take this out of this, you know, sort of theoretical concept and think about, you know, if you want to perform well in a, you know, a hundred mile race six months from now, you're going to be doing a lot of high volume running in the mountains, and you're probably going to be carrying significant kind of low level chronic fatigue with you most of the time. 
Well, it's not very likely during this buildup to this 100 mile race that you're going to perform particularly well in this near term, unless you were to taper, you know, back off or something like that. Um, again, I talked about it trains the fundamental qualities in isolation, and it's often not sport specific. Um, so when we're trying to train, you know, aerobic capacity, which is the fundamental thing that underlies all of endurance, you know, that doesn't necessarily, like you could be training for schemo or mountaineering and do it by running. Likewise, if you were training for, you know, doing some kind of strength training, you know, you could go into a gym and lift weights, even though that doesn't exactly look like the sport. Utilization training, on the other hand, is meant to improve near-term performance. So this is why we often will use um, utilization training in the final buildup to competition or your main event, the climb you're fitted for or, or whatever that is. But so it's it's often done in what we call the specific period, whereas the capacity training um, is often done in the base period. So when we get into the specific period, um, we're trying to do training that begins to model more closely what the actual demands of that event are. And it, it usually happens at the um, expense of long-term capacity. And this is one of the problems people get, and I'm gonna talk about this on the next slide, but this is a really common mistake, is that people overuse utilization training um, because they think, oh, this is what my event looks like. I should just train by doing whatever my event is all the time. And um, <clears throat> because in a way that makes intuitive sense. For instance, if you're a mountaineer and you're, you know, you're, you know that your event really is carrying heavy pack slowly uphill all the time or on your, on your climb, well, you're going to, if you were thinking this way and you're doing this utilization training, you would just go out and carry a heavy pack uphill every day. That would be the way you would train for that. And in a way that makes some intuitive sense, but it doesn't work that way. Because if you go back and think about if one of those fundamental qualities, and in most people's case, it will be the aerobic base capacity will be low. If one of those capacities is low, then piling it along. So when you're doing a heavy, carrying a heavy pack steeply uphill, you are fully utilizing whatever aerobic capacity you're bringing to that workout fully utilizing whatever muscular endurance capacity you're bringing to that workout, fully utilizing whatever strength you're being, bringing to that workout. And if any one of those things is lacking, then you're not going to get the maximum benefit of that workout. So if you take do this literal specificity thing of, okay, my, my event looks like carrying a pack uphill, I'm going to do it every darn day, then you're probably never going to elevate whatever that weakest quality is. So I hope that makes some sense. Um, you know, it would be similar, let's say to, uh, you know, if you were a world-class marathoner, that would mean you were going to go out the door and run a marathon, you know, at your, at your race pace every day. Well, that, as you can, you can imagine that would not end well, uh, wouldn't take very long. Um, a couple of analogies I want to make about um, capacity and utilization that might also help you um, understand it. You can think of, um, this training as like what capacity training in particular as like building the interstate highway system. It's long and slow and tedious. And along the way, there's going to be traffic jams and disruption, and it's going to be a pain when, you know, when they're working on the highway, but when they get that highway done, it's going to be able to handle a lot of traffic and move that traffic really fast. So if that's the, you know, the capacity is building that highway system. And then once the highway system is built and perfected, then we, we can utilize that highway system. And another way I think it's helpful to think of it is a bank account. So capacity training is like putting money in the bank and utilization training is almost literally taking money back out of that bank. That's why if you do too much utilization training, it, it can end badly. Um, and what ideally what we'd like to do in the base period leading into the utilization phase or the specific phase of training before the main event is we would like to have this bank account so big that once you get into your event, whether it's a single mountain you're climbing, a race, or a three-month expedition you're going to be on, you can write checks on that bank account like crazy and just spend money like crazy and not have to worry about bouncing a check. So I hope those two analogies, they've worked for me over the years to kind of wrap my head around this uh, capacity versus utilization. And I want to, now I'm going to tell a couple stories to help drive home um, this 
these points about how these things can be misinterpreted. So about 20 years ago, there was a, a Norwegian exercise physiologist named Jan Helgerud. And <clears throat> Helgerud proposed a theory. Basically, he was a, a researcher in um, rehabilitating cardiac uh, patients, people who had you know serious cardiac events in their life. And what he found was by doing a bunch of high intensity like interval style training, you know, with these cardiac patients, they recovered much quicker and actually developed quite a bit of fitness. Well, I mean, they weren't very fit, obviously, if they'd had a heart problem, so they were, they had, you know, maybe they were fit before, but they certainly weren't fit after they had their heart cut open and all kinds of things done. Um, and so what he saw though, was it, it makes a lot of sense of what I, I think I talked about this in the physiology section the the heart will respond by becoming stronger and bigger bigger capacity um with high intensity training it it also in, it responds well to low intensity training but it responds very quickly if you make if you tax your heart by running it up to near maximum heart rate you know several times in a week it will begin to be able to produce to pump more blood so that's what he was seeing and he made, I don't know why, I've listened to a lecture he did when he was here in the States one time, and I don't understand how he made this leap. But then he thought, well, if that's the case, then why are all these elite endurance athletes doing this huge volume of low intensity training? Why don't they just do a bunch of shorter, high intensity training? And somehow or another, this caught on. I don't understand it. I, I thought it was crazy at the time because um, it didn't jive with you know the, that heuristic that we have about endurance training that we've known for you know many decades. He managed to convince um, the coach of Marit Bjorgen. Now, Marit Bjorgen is the most successful cross-country skier ever to live. She has won, I don't know, I mean, a, at least a dozen Olympic gold medals and many time World Champ World Cup champion and world champion. And she had been training by traditional Norwegian methods her whole life, which are again, you know, the same stuff that you all understand, a high volume of pretty low intensity training. In fact, a recent study looked back at her career, she's retired now, and found that over the course of her 20 year career, 90% of her training volume um, was done below her aerobic threshold, 90%, and only 10% was done at higher intensity levels. But anyway, her coach and she bought this idea from Jan Helgerud. They switched her training one, one year um, to his routine, which was three days a week of four, four two, two times a day, three days a week, four times four minutes at in level four, high intensity uh, intervals. And that year she had the worst year of her career. In fact, she almost quit. Well, needless to say, she didn't go back to that training method. She switched back and went back to her normal type because that was that would that was utilization training, but she was missing the big aerobic capacity that she'd had in the past. Missy Franklin is another sad case here. Um, I don't know if you remember her name, but you probably remember um, Michael Phelps. So um, 17 gold Olympic gold medals. I was at a coaching symposium where Michael Phelps's coach was delivering a talk actually about capacity and utilization training. And um, he was a big believer of high, doing a lot of capacity training with um, Michael Phelps, which is probably the reason he was able to go to, was it three or four Olympics? I don't remember and perform well. Well, this young woman, Missy Franklin, um, was coached by a coach who did almost exclusively utilization training with her. At 15 years old, she broke the world's record in, I think it's a 200 meter freestyle and won an Olympic gold medal at 15. And everyone thought, oh my God, she's setting the world on fire. If she can do that at 15, wait till she's 25. That was the last she ever did. That was it. That was the end of her career, essentially. I mean, she did end up going to college, but she had a rather you know, on un, unsuccessful and certainly for somebody who hold, held a world record, uh, wasn't a very exciting college career. And he was convinced, and I think it made a lot makes a lot of sense to me, is that by doing a bunch of capacity training, she was obviously genetically very talented and a very hard worker. They were able to bring her up into top form very quickly. But because she didn't have the kind of capacity that it would take to develop long term, again, remember, one of these is short term development, the other is long term, she ended up you know, having basically one or two years of incredible success as compared to um, Michael Phelps. 
Nils Vanderpool, um, if you haven't read it, you probably should read How to Skate a 10K. So Nils Vanderpool wrote an article about how he what how he trained and before he won the 10,000 meter gold medal in the last Winter Olympics in speed skating. And basically he trained for, I think, about three years doing nothing but a high volume of very low intensity training. But then when it came time to prepare for the Olympics, he the pendulum swung entirely the other direction and he did almost exclusively utilization training. In his case, it was all of his workouts were skating at the pace that he needed to skate to break the world record and hopefully win the gold medal. Um, so he did all of his training was very, very specific and utilizing all the capacities that he'd built over time. So there's just some examples of what I've seen in the real world of how these two things work out and how they, you know, obviously we want to be thinking about capacity training first, utilization training comes later. This is a little hard to see. I hope you can make some sense of it, but this is, you know, we use a zone system and to, to um, define different intensity levels. And I think it's, you know, it, it could be done in many different ways. Um, I mean, if you were a, a road runner, you could do this by running pace. So likewise, if you were a swimmer, you know, where every pool is 50 meters long, then you could do it by race pace. And, you know, you could determine the paces of each one of these zones. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury with these mountain sports that take place in, you know, different conditions. So, you know, and so one day you might be running and the next day you might be skiing. Um, the next day you might be mountaineering. So we need something that allows us to have a, a somewhat of an apples to apples comparison of the intensity of, of the way we train. So unfortunately we're stuck with heart rate. Um, then there is some, there's new work being done on power meters. And in fact, um, this next week, I'm going to be interviewing a guy who's come up with, I think, a really novel type of power meter that works for runners and probably may even work for mountaineers. We're not, I'm not sure yet. But anyway, so we're kind of stuck with heart rate, which is a rather poor proxy for intensity, um, but it's the best we've got. So we will define the um, these heart rate zones. Um, one, basically one through four. Now the fifth zone doesn't really have a heart rate because it's essentially as hard as you can go. And you're only going to be able to keep it up for, you know, less than a minute. And so, and heart rate is really kind of irrelevant to that because it takes a while for the heart rate to catch up with the, the intensity, but you all have no doubt experienced what zone five feels like. You just, you know, you go as hard as you feel like you can go until you just can't go anymore at all. Um, and you know what I've decided, what I've done in there, I've got you know the perceived effort, uh, which you know in this case is pretty much unsustainable and maximum. Um, then the training effect, what it's what we're trying to achieve with the training effect here, power and speed. Um, and you know the, then the mechanism, excuse me, the metabolism. Um, this is a, a, a stored a, um, ATP and creatine phosphate. Um, and this basically uses all the muscle fibers you can recruit. And then it's done in a duration of, you know, just a few seconds to, I mean, even a minute, I think it'd be very hard for um, anyone to, to maintain. So probably 30 seconds is closer to it. Then we step down to what we, this is more appropriate for endurance athletes is um, the high end of the aerobic work that you might do, what we call zone four. And this is above that anaerobic threshold, which we spoke about so much in the last two talks. So I'm not going to define that anymore, but if you need to, you can go back and, and watch those or read in the books about those. But so this is hard and it's basically maximum sustainable effort, but it's an effort you can sustain for several minutes. Um, it kind of maxes the aerobic and the anaerobic capacities during this. Um, it's going to use all the slow twitch and many of the fast twitch fibers. And, you know, a, a very well-trained athlete with good muscular endurance could maintain this effort for uh, as long as probably seven or eight minutes. Typically, this is something people will maintain for in the range of two to five minutes um, when they're doing this high intensity type interval work. Um, and when you go longer than that, you'll necessarily have to slow down. Um, this is the intensity at which one would be able to measure their 
um, max maximum aerobic capacity, maximum aerobic power, which is the um, Hold on, my, my dog is having a dream. Um, sorry, <laughs> he got really tired in our ski today and he's lying on the floor dreaming. Um, anyway, this would be the intensity that's used in a test where you would define your um, maximum aerobic power, max VO2. Um, and again, that's usually, max VO2 is a, a, an intensity you can only sustain for you know probably two to three minutes. Then we have the zone three, which is a really important one for endurance athletes. Uh, that zone four gets used very little, especially in these ultra long distances that most of our mountain athletes are training for. Um, it, can, it can be beneficial because it can help develop muscular endurance and some strength. Now, zone three plays a little bit bigger role. It's a little bit lower intensity. It fits in between the anaerobic intensity and down to the aerobic intensity, or excuse me, aerobic threshold, excuse me. Um, and this feels like, you know, it's hard. You feel like you're training. In some cases, that makes this, this um, intensity zone one that's easy to gravitate to because you get done with this workout, you actually feel like you trained and you did something. Um, it feels kind of fun, hard. It should not feel exhausting. If it's exhausting, it's probably up there in, in level four. Um, it's developing aerobic capacity. It, it also helps with the lactate shuttle. And because you can do a fairly high volume of it, it, it can help improve, um, let's say, running economy would be another reason for, um, that, to use this. It is heavily dependent on the glycolytic anaerobic pathway um, because at this point, fat can the aerobic um, pathway can no longer produce ATP fast enough. And so the glycolytic metabolism has to begin to dominate in order to produce ATP fast enough. Um, this can be used for, you know, intervals, Absolutely. you know, probably as short as 10 minutes to 20 minutes or even continuous, you know, 30 to 60 minutes long. It's not, not at all uncommon for people to use all that, that full range basically. Um, and it's undecided what's, you know, most beneficial, probably somebody who's doing a multi-hour event, doing a steady state for 30 to 60 minutes, whereas somebody who maybe is training for, you know, a marathon doing 10 minute, uh, doing several 10 minute repetitions would probably be more effective because they might be moving a little faster. And then we get into zone two, which by now you've probably heard me talk all you want to ever hear about zone two. This is really the one that builds aerobic capacity the most um, effectively. And um, it's going to, for people who are very fit, have a high aerobic capacity, this is going to feel somewhat taxing because it's so close to their anaerobic threshold. So they're, let's say we'll use running because it's an easy thing to think about. They'll be running very close to the same speed that they would be running up at that anaerobic threshold. You know, and as a consequence, it's taxing metabol not, not so much metabolically, but neuromuscularly, it can be taxing. Um, if you are aerobically deficient, this speed will be so low that these workouts will feel reduced easy to the point of somebody who's got real aerobic deficiency will be disbelieving when they when they see how slow they need to train in order to actually build aerobic capacity they'll think well how can this possibly do anything i'm moving so slowly but you have to keep in mind that the reason you're moving slowly is that is all the energy your aerobic system is capable of producing if you go faster than that and then you're going to be up there. You're actually metabolically, even though it doesn't feel very fast, but meta metabolically, you're moving into zone three where the glycolytic metabolic pathway um, begins to take over. And so you'll actually be detraining the aerobic um, pathway. So this is really just slow twitch fibers. Um, and it can be, you know, continuous, you know, you know, an hour, even up to two hours, probably for some people that are very fit. Um, now the the zone one is gonna it's a little bit arbitrary. Although some of you might have listened to the podcast I did with um, Judd Van Sickle last week, he is the um, sports science director at um, at UC Davis um, Sports Performance Laboratory, and um, we talked about zone one, and I was. Pleased to hear him confirm that he also likes to kind of just pick an arbitrary number of about 10%. The top, the top of zone one is about 10% below the aerobic threshold or the top of zone two. And so we're going to make this zone, you know, roughly 10% wide. So we're going to go from, you know, the aerobic threshold 
um, minus 20% up to the aerobic threshold minus 10. This should feel quite easy for, for everyone. It could be used for really long distance um, when maybe you're going out for a five or six hour run um, in the mountains. Well, probably you're gonna spend quite a bit of time in this zone one and maybe bounce up into zone two occasionally. Um, and then we have a re the recovery. And I hesitate to put a uh, an intensity or let's say a, a heart rate on this, but it should feel extremely light it's not about training. You're not doing this to train. You're doing this to recover, to allow you to get back to training as, as quickly as possible. And it could it can be completely unsport specific. In fact, for a lot of the runners I work with, I encourage them to swim um, for their recovery workouts, even if they are terrible swimmers. They can just get in the pool, hang on the, the gutter on the side and flutter kick for 15 or 20 minutes. Um, it's doing something to get the blood moving you know, if they're if they're normally running, I don't usually have them do their recovery workouts as running unless they're extremely strong, um, because if that's just more pounding. So we'll often use a bicycle. This could be yoga. It could be going for a walk in the evening with your do your dog. It could be, um, you know, it could be just a stretching session or you know, rolling on a hard ball or foam roll or that sort of thing. It, again, it's not about training. It's about getting you back to training as quickly as possible. So now we've kind of beaten the intensity zones to death. I'm going to move on to some kind of principles. These are, again, kind of heuristics that have come around because they work. Um, you, need to have, you need to be continuous in your application of these training stresses. Um, I, I wrote an article that I left back at Uphill Athlete called The Weekend Weekend Warrior. And you know, the basic problem with Many people who think they're training, but what they actually do is what we coaches might re really refer to as random exercise. So they might have some pals that are going to go out and do this mega ski tour this weekend. And it's going to be, you know, they're going to ski into a hut. It's going to take six hours. And the next day they're going to be touring all around and ski back out. They're going to do these two monstrous days and probably maybe only train one other day during the week because their work and family commitments don't allow that don't allow them much time. And while that can work, it's never going to work very well because your body doesn't like to be shocked and overloaded. What it will do is it will tend to break down, you know, whether it's overtraining or just, you know, massive amounts of fatigue. The person who did that ski tour that I was just talking about, they would probably be so wrecked for four or five days, they might not have, be able to train. Um, and so being continuous in your training application. So, you know, trying to get in frequent stimuli, especially to the aerobic system, even if it's a 20 minute run, that's all you can fit in, you know, four days a week. Well, that's better than going five days with no aerobic stimulus at all. The, the next one is gradualness. So again, this relates back to the fact that our body does not really like to be hit really hard with a sledgehammer. You know, you mentally, you're maybe tough enough to you know, beat on your body and, you know, make it do things, but it's not going to respond well. What it will respond well to is a gradual overloading of the training stimulus and gradual increase of the training stimulus. So you slightly overload, you slightly exceed your capacity for whatever this type of work is you're trying to do, and your body will respond by adapting to that. Whereas if you aren't gradual and you make huge leaps it actually won't respond well. In fact, you can detrain that way. You can actually get less fit that way. And the third is modulation, um, hard, easy. So there should be a period where you're, you know, overloading. And, in, you know, in some case, this might be one workout on one day. It might be, you know, for a professional athlete, it might be a training camp or a block of training. It could be anywhere from two or three days to, you know, a week where there's a big overload. Now, normally in a situation like that, I want to caveat this, that we would, uh, a tra before a training camp or a big overreaching period like that, we would taper the athlete going into that. And then there would be a significant recovery period after um, an overreaching block like that. But again, that is also modulation. You know, your body will respond if you push it hard and then let it rest and push it hard again and let it rest. Um 
So those are kind of three really important, I believe, uh, principles to keep in mind when you're training. If you can keep all three of those things going in your training, you're going to be, you're about 90% of the way there. And then we'll talk a little bit about specificity. I've already talked about how it can get overused, but I want to talk about, you know, people often ask me and our other coaches about cross-training, like how much benefit comes from cross-training. It depends. <laughs> Um, depends on a lot of things, but um, you know, if you were training for a marathon, then spending a lot of hours in the pool swimming is probably not going to carry over to your um, to your to your running at all, almost at all. It might be good recovery, but it's probably not going to increase your running capacity. Um, on the other hand, let's say you are training for a sport like ski mountaineering um, or schemo racing, and you're doing a fair bit of running, but you also get on your bike. Well, and especially standing on a bicycle, if you look at the way a schemo racer, look at them in profile from the side as they're running up a very steep grade, and then take that image of what that profile looks like and put it on a bicycle with somebody standing on a bicycle holding the handlebars. And you'll see that the biomechanically, those things look very, very similar. So probably really similar joint range of motion, very similar um, muscle usage. And so then, yeah, the, there's gonna be pretty darn good carryover to that kind of training. And that also is important. This, I, I kind of learned a lot about cross training when I was training cross country skiers, because until fairly recently, they didn't, you just didn't get on snow very often. You know, you couldn't train on the snow on snow 12 months of the year. Now they've got underground ski tunnels and people travel long distances to, to stay on snow many months of the year. But you know, 20, 30 years ago, that wasn't so common. And so we had to come up with other ways of training. Well, and cross-country skiers also usually were also quite good cross-country runners because they did so much of their training running. And it did seem to carry over quite well. And likewise, cycling seemed to carry over quite well. Again, mostly in the standing position, because again, it looked like the position you might be um, skate, skiing up a steep hill, but whether skating technique or, or a classic stride isn't so important. So in some cases, cross-training will be real beneficial. Other cases, it probably isn't very beneficial. But more importantly than that, especially for the amateur athlete, is do you enjoy it? Um, if you enjoy it, then you should probably continue to do it, even if it means sacrificing some of the more specific training. If it's going to be what gets you out the door and gets you with a, a group of friends, then by all means, you know, you, you, if you're not training for the Olympics, you know, you need to be training. Well, even if you're training for the Olympics, you need to be training because you love it. Um, so keep that in mind. I hope that helps. Um, another really important concept that is individuality. And I like to use this quote that came from Renato Canova, um, that if you give 10 athletes the exact same workout, you'll get 10 different responses. And I've seen this true in, you know, I've actually seen this play out in real life, maybe not with 10, but with several. Um, and it has to do with you know, your, the, your lifetime training history, what's your training history look like in the last few years? Um, what are, you know, your life stress that you have to deal with your time constraints and your genetics. So use your, um, you know, you need to train in a way that benefits you and you need to figure that's why we're going to look at those fundamental qualities that I mentioned before. Um, Next slide here, um, why I don't think it's a great idea to try to, tr to train just like a pro. This is a, this graph is a graph from Killian Journey's blog. You might remember he and I talked a lot about this on the podcast we did together. You see that little red circle out at the right hand end. That's about the last six months of his training before he had a phenomenal racing season this last summer, ending with winning the UTMB and running under 20 hours on it. And the article was basically telling everybody, hey, you know, don't get carried away with that little red circle. Look what I've been doing. That's 13 years of training. Um, that's really what made the difference. But what ended up happening is I, I listened to him on several other podcasts, and they all wanted to focus on the things he did in these last six months. And, and you know, that 
he could have done anything those last six months probably and done and, and still made a huge, um, had, had a very impressive racing season. So, you know, and most of us will never be able to handle that kind of training. We don't have 13 years of this type of uh, base behind us. And often I see this kind of stuff put out there in the, on the internet, um, as kind of clickbait, just to get people to read an article or look at things. Um, this has this, you know, there's that famous psychologist, I've forgotten his name, calls this the iceberg effect that, you know, we see the tip of the iceberg, that's a little red circle out there at the end, you know, Killian's performance. What we don't see is the whole rest of the iceberg that's below the surface. Um, so now I, I wanted to talk a little bit about recovery and super compensation. Um, this, he, what we got right here is, uh, was, a, um, a chart that was built by um, Jan Olbrecht, a great book called The Science of Winning. If you're ever interested in learning any everything there is to know almost about lactate, blood lactate um, training. Um, so he talks, he's got a two hour training session there with the blue line being, you know, a zone one and two. It shows that you're going to be pretty fully recovered in about 12 hours. So you should be able to get out and do the same thing the next day that you just did another two hour session like that. Now, this is just, he arbitrarily chose a two hour workout, you know, a little bit higher intensity, you know, somewhere um, in zones in zone three, actually that that's a misprint there. It should be just zone three. You can see it's going to take a little longer to recover out there to a day, a day and a half. Um, and when you get up into zone four, you notice now it gets quite a bit longer when in zone five and strength training are way out there, three days for recovery from these things. Now, the problem is we almost never train each one of these things exactly by itself, except maybe the blue line on aerobic capacity and strength or the high intensity stuff is on, you know, four and five, but there's usually a mix of these things. And so this, this chart is, this is a model. This is what we use as a model to help us understand this idea. Don't take it, you know, verbatim. Um, and then last slide talking about recovery, you know, it's important to understand that training makes you weaker. You get stronger during the recovery. That's hopefully you saw that here in the super compensation phase with each one of these different training loads. And what are the secrets to recovery? You know, the big, is, big one is sleep. You know, you need to get sleep. That's when your body repairs itself and does all these adaptations. Obviously, diet is important. Um, massage, self-massage with, you know, things like, a, you know, Theragun or um, uh, E-Stim and all those kinds of things. These recovery sessions that I talked about um, before that I think can all be very useful. And then there's all kinds of gizmos on you know the market, everything from ice baths to the Normatec boots to you name it. There's a million things. I don't have a lot of experience with those. So I just grouped them under gizmos because I haven't used them. Um, but these others I think are pretty well, well proven. So I'm going to leave it there. That gives us a 10 minutes almost to, to entertain some, some questions. Does anybody have any questions? I'd love to hear from you if you do. Um, oh, sorry. I, I do have a question. Yes, sir. Who's this? Oh, Jack. Okay. Hello. Um, I had a question. I'm I'm trying to devise a training plan at present for like alpine summertime alpine rock climbing, and I've found that it's challenging because I want to train my aerobic capacity for the approach and the descent, but I also want to engage in like specific training for the actual rock climbing, and I don't want to. I guess it feels like you kind of have to sacrifice one or the other. Like if I want to get a become a better rock climber in those technical skills. I need to sacrifice the aerobic training. But if I want to get better at aerobics for the approach and the descent, things like that, I'll, I'll not be training rock climbing and I'll get worse at climbing. Well, the, the lucky thing about this is that the, the two systems you're training you know, are pretty much at the opposite ends of the physiological spectrum. So you're in luck um, that you know, aerobic base training, you could do it running, hiking, whatever. And Whereas the, the rock climbing, you know, you're talking um, strength and power primarily, obviously technique, but we won't address that right now. Um, and you can do those things at the opposite ends of the physiological spectrum because they don't overlap very much. Now, here's there is a caveat to that or a warning about that is if you go out for a three hour run and then you go into the climbing gym later that day and expect to do a hard bouldering session, that's not going to work very well because the central nervous system will have taken quite a hit during that three hour run. 
a long duration endurance um, exercise really hits your central nervous system hard. So when it comes time to generate high forces in the climbing gym or you know high precision movements you know, with the technique, you're going to your whole your whole nervous system is going to be dulled down. So the way to do that, and we work with a lot of folks in this situation who are doing trying to do exactly what you do. I mean, almost every climber, well, not every, but a lot of climbers, you know, they want to go climb in the mountains, um, but they also want to climb at a fairly high level. So they want to train for rock climbing. But you can put on a you can do a high volume of aerobic running or let's say or hiking in the morning and then you could do a, a high volume climbing session that's you know relatively low intensity for you in the evening and without worrying that the, either one is going to be diminished or if you were planning a high intensity um let's say you know four by four intervals on your um, um on a splatter wall or you were going to be doing um you know um, let's say a systems wall or hangboard or hard bouldering session you would want to do those before the big endurance session. So try to do those early in the day and then later, or even immediately afterwards, you could do go do the, the run or whatever the endurance thing is. So those two can be combined pretty darn well. Um, you will run into a time and energy issue there. I mean, obviously, you know, the reason that you know, the best rock climbers in the world don't do a lot of endurance training is that, you know, they need all the time and energy to devote to that. But you know, you're already, when you're talking about alpine rock climbing, you're already talking about somewhat of a compromise a situation. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Um, what, what's your, just kind of a quick follow-up, what is your opinion for, because um, of course there's the aerobic training, like running and hiking, and then specific training, like actual climbing. What about lifting weights and, and sort of like general strength? Does that fit in? It does. And this, we're going to talk about strength in one of our next future videos, but I'll, I'll really uh, uh, quickly cover this. And that is that when it comes to general strength, there obviously a certain level of it is needed. Okay. If you can't do one pull up, then you better practice pull ups if you hope to be a very good climber. But if you can do 10 pull ups, there's a good chance that pull up strength is not you know, going from 10 to 15 or 15 to 20 is not going to make you a better climber. So at some point along the way, you're, you can, you can realize that um, increasing general strength will no longer add to your, your sport, your performance in your sport. Likewise, you know, deadlift, great exercise. It's a pretty good exercise for runners, but only you know, like if you can't deadlift your own body weight, then yeah, you probably better do some deadlifting. It would probably help you. But if you did, it would probably make you a little better runner. But you know, being able to go from two to two and a half times your body weight, that's probably going to be a waste of your energy and time. So at some point, you will want to be doing more sport specific type of strength training. So hangboard or actual climbing. But there's some benefit. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I wish there was, it's, there's no clear cut answer to that, Jack. But I, and I, I think I've mentioned this in other cases that there have been many, many studies done on lots of different sports trying to decide at what point increasing general strength no longer benefits the sport. And probably it's been done, you know, a thousand times and nobody has an answer. And I certainly don't. So, okay, somebody else. Hey, Scott, this yes, is sir. Craig. Uh, so I'm trying to boost my aerobic capacity, um, but I don't have a lot of time due to my uh, work and life demands. So I'm I, I'm in a position where I can work a couple days from home, and I'm wondering if even though I'm trying to train um, aerobic capacity and running, I can double dip my time working from home and training in zone two on an exercise bike. I know they're biomechanically different, but is that it's better than nothing? It's certainly better than yeah, sitting on your butt in an office. You bet. Um, yeah, it's you know, and one of the one of the elite runners I coach, Tom Evans. You you've probably maybe have even heard a couple of podcasts I've done with it. Tom uses a bike a lot for his training. Now he runs a huge amount. He runs a hundred miles a week, but he also adds in bike training partly because he likes it, partly because it allows him to add aerobic volume without beating himself up. So, you know, 
given the trade-off that you're looking at, Craig, whether it's not exercising at all or exercising on a bike, yeah, I think you would be wise to, to use the bike. Okay. Sounds good. It, it would be as a supplement to, I'm, I'm doing about two days of running a week, two days of rock climbing a week. Um, it'd be a supplement to those. Yeah. I, I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Thanks. I appreciate it. You betcha. Hey, Scott, this is uh, Rob here. Oh, hey, Rob. You've been asking us some great questions in the past, so fire away. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. So uh, the question I had today um, is about like assessment and reassessment. So my own background um, like uh, tends to be more a little bit with the strength training side of things, but apparently I've been an endurance athlete most of my life and only started realizing it after reading your old articles and, and now. But I think of it in terms of, um, or I guess the question has to do with um, after you spend some time to uh, kind of go through the transition period just to get your body used to structured endurance work, um, it seems to me like that's when you suggest would be a good time to get somewhat accurate uh, of like a data for the aerobic threshold and for the uh, the anaerobic. But after that, uh, kind of curious your thoughts for reassessment and like, I mean, I know, of course, if you're doing events, you're kind, you'll kind of get a snapshot as you go. But what are your thoughts as for being able to kind of uh, take another baseline for has the threshold changed at all? Or, uh, you know, where and how might you want to push harder versus back off on training? Um, that kind of thing. Okay, I think it's a great idea to reassess those, th those two two really important metabolic you know, um, breakpoints, the aerobic and anaerobic threshold. Um, so the way I often describe it to people is, you know, let's say you're a runner. I don't know, Robert, are you a runner or are you doing your aerobic training another way? Mainly, uh, yeah, trail and a little bit of road here and there. Okay. So you probably have a trail or a loop near your home or some favorite trail that you run frequently. Right. And so you probably know some landmarks on it. There will be a time, you know, what, let maybe you run on it twice a week. Well, you, you run on it now and you know how long it takes you to get to that rock. Okay. It takes 45 minutes to get to that rock. Right. And then three weeks later, you're running it and you're, you know, same kind of heart rate, feeling pretty, pretty same, same um, perceived exertion. And you get to that rock in 42 minutes and you go, huh. What's happened? So what's happened is your aerobic system is now able to produce more ATP. So you're running faster for essentially the same heart rate. And then you would say, okay, I need to reassess my aerobic capacity. I need to reassess my aerobic threshold because if your aerobic threshold pace has increased because yours has in that case, because you were a few minutes faster, then you're probably your aerobic threshold heart rate is also increased. So you could redo an aerobic threshold test, like the heart rate drift test would be a great way to do it. Right. So I usually look for some kind of, you know, small performance, you know, remember these performance gains are not smooth. It's not a smooth gain or smooth um, improvement. You know, it's kind of like a picket fence. You're going to have good days and bad days. And, but over the course of a few weeks, you should notice you're going to, you're going to have one of those really good days. And you're going to think, wow, something has happened. I'm definitely fitter than I was three weeks ago. And so that's when I would redo that test. Um, and, you know, so if you're and if you're really concentrating mostly right now on just improving the aerobic capacity, you know, you don't need to redo the anaerobic right. threshold test. There is a, there is a chance. And I mean, there's a pretty significant, a good chance that if you're in a long period of improving aerobic capacity, like if you were aerobically deficient and you're just working on aerobic capacity, there's a good chance your aerobic threshold, your anaerobic threshold running speed and heart rate will actually decline a little bit because they're not getting any stim, you're not doing any high intensity training. So they're not getting any stimulus. The good news though, is that once you go back to doing a little more zone three or zone four training, those things respond literally within hours. And, you know, within a couple, a few weeks, you're going to see huge gains there. So even though it declines a little bit, it's not the end of the world. Okay. But I think it, do it just based on performance. Totally. Okay. Whenever Makes you see a, a performance gain, you're probably not going to see that gain in, um, more frequently than, you know, once a month, you know, once every month to six weeks or something like that, you'll notice that improvement depending on the volume you're training, of course. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah.
Well, we've kind of shot our hour. I thought I, I thought I was going to be done in a little more time, but it seems like we might have answered most of the questions. Um, if anyone else has a question, I'm happy to stay on. And or if you want to um, ask any, if you think of something after we're done, please ask on the forum. We have a section of the forum that is devoted to this book club group, and where you, know, you can ask your questions. And it's, it'll be great because other people will be able to see the answers, and they'll probably have had the same um, the same kind of questions that that you have too. So. But thanks, everybody, for attending. I really appreciate it. It was fun having you all along. Next time, we will, I think we're taught, I can't remember what chapter four is, but I think it's about, hold on, I have a book right here. Um, it is monitoring. Yeah, we're going to talk about monitoring your training, um, how to track, um, you know, that you're not overdoing or underdoing. So I think that that's another really, really useful tool. So, um, and we'll put out a, a something on Instagram and on the website. Um, and I think, and John also emails everybody with the, the date and time. It'll be, you know, somewhere near the end of April, towards the end of April. But again, thanks a lot, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Scott. Really appreciate Thank it. you. All right. Bye bye. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Scott. I, uh... I have a question if you're willing to take yeah, a couple minutes. Sure, go ahead. Who is this? Uh, th th this is Brett. Uh, good oh, to, hi, Brett. Yeah, good, good to chat again. Uh, it's been a minute. Uh, yeah, a little more of a conceptual question, uh, just regarding utilization training uh, generally being like the most sport and event specific, uh, but then also utilization training uh, seeming to be where you recommend adding the most intensity, uh, e even if the event isn't necessarily like, like, like you might be doing an event that's like a you'll be in zone one or two for most of the time uh yeah yeah like in the utilization period uh that it doesn't it doesn't necessarily like, yeah. let me stop for you for a second there I so yeah. i make sure i understand what you're asking but i think i understand um is that it doesn't necessarily need to have high intensity often i mean most events that are shorter you know most sporting events are even endurance events are shorter than two hours mm -hmm. so most endurance training will end up in a period of utilization training that has high intensity because that that high intensity is needed in those you know events that are shorter than two or three hours now if you're talking about many hours then utilization training can also be modeling your event by doing you know a, 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 um Okay, let's, let's from the take from. Let me. Are you training for some sort of ultra trail run or something like that? Uh, yeah, like a like a long duration ski mountaineering objective. Okay, so the this again, it's a similar mistake that people make when they're doing utilization training, um, in that they try to make it look too much like their event. So um, when I've trained, I've coached a lot of folks to run hundred mile races and even 200 plus mile races like the Tour de Géant or um, there's you know, all those 200 mile crazy distances. We never do anything that approaches that duration. Um, you know, last year, I would say, you know, in training Tom Evans leading up to his third place finish at the UTMB, um, I believe we he did one eight hour day, um, you know that you know nowhere near as long as his event, and you know so typically I don't try to mimic the extent, just like I don't try to mimic the intensity of the event too often in a shorter events utilization training, with an ultra long event I don't try to mimic the duration of the event too specifically either because i don't think you need it and i think it ends up it, again it just like all utilization training it's going to take some money out of the bank so if you go out and do you know let's say you're going to go do a, a super long you know ski tour i don't know maybe bugs to rogers or something like that um you that's going to be what is the record that kylie said is 40 hours or some crazy number like that um you know, I wouldn't recommend anybody train for 40 hours to prepare for that thing. You know, maybe the longest ski session might be, you know, four or five hours maximum. Mm -hmm. um, because if you do too much volume, just like if you do too much intensity, it can push you over the edge. Does that, am I addressing your question well enough? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. I appreciate it.
I, I guess a, a follow-up would be, I'd be curious if pretty specifically with like high level athletes, like uh, people who don't have like a huge aerobic base, I'm sure would just want to continue with the like lots of aerobic base building. But I'm curious if high, high level athletes who are like uh, trying to take on events that are like, you know, very long, many hours uh, would be uh, beneficial to like include some higher intensity in the capacity training as a way of like bumping up that anaerobic threshold a bit to make more space to then like continue building their aerobic base? That's a great question. And it's very clever that you thought of that. Yes, that's absolutely true. So I mean, I probably wouldn't have, you know, somebody who's training for a hundred mile run doing, you know, much, much zone five training. Although Tom Evans did do some short sprints um, for building power in his legs. And we do, we have this hill sprints, which I've written about in the books. Both of the books have sections on that. I think their hill sprints are really valuable for every kind of mountain athlete. Um, so, you know, he was doing these things that were eight to 10 seconds long. Um, so, and, but in terms of the, we didn't really do any zone four training, I almost do, almost do no zone four training with him, but we do do a fair bit of zone three training um, with him and other people who can do these ultra long distance events, because as you say, tr it can bump up the, uh, and the anaerobic threshold, the anaerobic threshold, like the aerobic threshold kind of likes to be nudged up from below. So it's better to train. If you're trying to raise the anaerobic threshold, it's better to train in zone three than above it in zone four. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Doing in, in, especially in a case, I think, well, you, if you're training for like, are you talk, talking about a schemo race or like ski mountaineering with, you know, heavy gear? Uh, it, it'd be a heavy, like probably four day, uh, four day trip. Then I would recommend your high intensity work rather than thinking about zone three or vote four should be muscular endurance work mm -hmm. because you're, you're going to be moving relatively slowly with, you know, a heavy weight on each foot and a fairly heavy pack probably. So you would benefit rather than let's say going to a hill and, you know, even on skis doing intervals up and down that hill, I would recommend you doing our kind of classic muscular endurance training, which is, you know, put a heavy pack on, find a very steep hill, or believe it or not, a really effective way for ski training um, is to do it on a stair machine with a really heavy pack, mm -hmm. stair master. Um, you might recall Jack um, Ken Kudzel, who's one of our coaches who holds a whole bunch of FKTs for uh, on skis and on foot. Um, he does almost all of his intensity with as muscular endurance training on a stair machine, even for his um, ski FKTs. Mm -hmm. So, because that's very specific to the demands of the event you're training for. It's you're, you're going to be moving at a relatively low speed. So in it's kind of be, it's sort of low intensity from the, you know, cardiovascular standpoint, but high intensity from the muscular endurance standpoint. So that muscular endurance tra tra training mimics the demands a little better than let's say interval training would. Cool. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time. Sure. You're very welcome. Thanks for asking good questions. Anybody else? All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, we'll see all of you next month.